गुड मॉर्निंग आई होप यू ऑल आर फाइन सो वी हैव टॉक्ड अबाउट रशियन फॉर्मलिज्म एंड वी हैव आल्सो टॉक्ड अबाउट न्यूट्रिट सर्जन एंड टुडे टुडे आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट अबाउट सम न्यू क्रिटिक्स एंड दीज आर द न्यू क्रिटिक्स हु हु इंपैक्टेड न्यू क्रिट सर्जन and i am going to begin with t e hume i hope you remember that uh, t e hume uh, he started an anti romantic revolution in poetry and uh, he wrote an essay romanticism and classicism and it was published in 1913 i mean it was written in 1913 now in this essay he wrote i'm just quoting uh, two lines from the essay uh, he wrote i object even to the best of romantics and he further said uh, i object to to the sloppiness which does not consider that a poem is a poem unless it is moaning about something or other then uh, in the same essay he he points out some some differences between romanticism and classicism i mean he he gives his his romantic view and then he gives his his classical view right now what is the romantic view and what is the classical view so regarding you know his his romantic view we can say that i mean he says Uh, i'm just just explaining from the essay uh, it is it is uh, he says that uh, man is intrinsically good but spoiled by circumstances so this is the romantic view and the classical view is man is intrinsically limited but he is disciplined by order and tradition to to something fairly decent so these are the two views one is the romantic view and the other is the classical view the romantic view states that man is intrinsically good but uh, spoiled by circumstances and the classical view is that man is intrinsically limited but disciplined by order and tradition right then he says that uh, romantics are regarded as a well of possibilities and classicals uh, they are regarded as finite and fixed fine further he says that uh, classical view it leads to poetry and romantic view you know it leads to uncontrolled flights of emotions and and metaphors right now t e hume feels that uh, new poets uh, they will disclaim the thought that poetry is is a tool for expressing emotions but rather it provides a precise description of the world around it fine so this is something about about t e hume now let us let us uh, let us talk about uh, t s eliot and uh, if you remember t s eliot was very much impacted by t e hume fine you all know that t s eliot is a major force in in the literary scene of the 20th century and he he defines criticism as a rational analysis of literature fine now we find that t s eliot is an analytical critic and and he rejects impressionistic criticism now what is impressionistic criticism you know it's a kind of criticism that that focuses on on how the work of art affects the critic how the work of art affects the critic means it focuses on on general feelings or thoughts rather than specific knowledge or facts fine now to t s eliot criticism is is the disinterested exercise of intelligence fine 
So he somehow, you know, like, like I, A. Richards. And uh, like Richards, Eliot basically wanted to elevate criticism to the level of objectivity in science. What I mean to say is that, that he expected a critic to, to dissect a work of art dispassionately like a scientist, means like a botanist or like a zoologist. Fine. Then, as, as I have told you that uh, uh, he, was, he was very much impacted by, uh, you know, he was very much impacted by T. E. Hume, who, who revolted against romantic poetry. So, this, this term romantic, uh, it, it became a term of abuse, both for Eliot and, uh, you know, T. E. T. E. Hume. Fine. Then I hope you remember that uh, T.S. Eliot, he wrote, he wrote an essay tradition and individual talent. Now, he wrote this essay in 1919 and uh, this essay, it is, it is considered as an unofficial manifesto of the criticism of T.S. Eliot. Fine. So, he begins this essay with, with a revolutionary redefinition of the concept of Tradition. Now, what is tradition? How does he define tradition in this essay? See, to T.S. Eliot, uh, tradition does not mean a, a, a blind or timid imitation to the practices of previous generations. But uh, it, is, it is the possession of a historical sense. It is the possession of a historical sense which involves a perception not only of the pastness of the past but of its presence. Right? So it is a kind of, you know, possession of a historical sense and it involves a perception not only of the pastness of the past but of its presence. Fine. So according to T.S. Eliot, you know, this, this historical sense, it compels a man to write not merely with his own generation in his bones, but with a feeling that, that the whole of the literature of Europe beginning from Homer, it, it has a simultaneous existence and, and it composes, uh, you know, simultaneous authors. I hope you are getting my point. Fine. So, for T.S. Eliot, you know, tradition stands for a value-saturated past. It is a living organism. It is a living organism comprising a past and present in constant mutual interaction. Is that clear? Then, uh, you know, you can say that, uh, uh, you know, by, by tradition, uh, Eliot, Eliot does not mean, you know, dead remains of the past, but uh, as a simultaneous order in which, you know, the major texts of tradition coexist in an organized manner in the minds of present writers. Fine. Then in the same essay, I mean tradition and individual uh, talent. Uh, if you remember, you know, he, he talks about his, his impersonality theory of art. And here, you know, he rejects uh, subjectivity or subjectivism. Fine. And, uh, you know, he also attacks on, on William Wordsworth, particularly the, the definition of poetry which has been given by, by William Wordsworth. So Wordsworth regarding poetry says that uh, uh, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And it takes its origin from the emotions recollected in, in tranquility. But uh, T.S. Eliot, you know, he rejects this, this definition outrightly. And he says that, you know, poetry is not a turning loose of emotions. But it is an escape from emotions. Further, he says that it is not the expression of personality, but it is an escape from personality. Fine. So the fact is that, you know, to, to T.S. Eliot, you know, criticism is a kind of 
scientific enquiry into a work of art into a work of art and a critic has to see this work of art you know as it is in reality as it is in reality so it is the disinterested exercise of intelligence fine then uh, you know there are two more terms which which i would like to i would like to clarify to you people uh, the first one is you know objective correlative it's a famous term uh, given by t s eliot in his essay hamlet and and which which problems published in the sacred wood right so this is something you know which i would like to discuss in detail and uh, i have prepared two clips on objective correlative and what are the ideas of t s eliot on objective correlative and uh, you know why hamlet uh, the play of shakespeare why it has it has been called an artistic failure by 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 t s eliot and how this objective correlative is working in in you know macbeth and and you know how it is working in in you know uh, the wasteland by by t s eliot fine so i have two separate clips on it so i'll send uh, the two clips to you because the term is very very crucial for you to understand fine then the next term is uh, dissociation of sensibility so again this term has been used by t s eliot in his essay the metaphysical poet and this essay was published in selected essays fine now in this essay t s eliot uh, he basically points out a major fault in the victorian poets like tennyson and browning now what is the fault of these two poets i mean uh, browning and and tennyson eliot says that the negative quality or the negative characteristic uh, of these two poets is the the dissoci dissociation of thought and feeling in their poems right so what do they do i mean uh, browning and and tennyson so eliot feels that these two poets they think but they do not feel their thought as immediately as the smell of a rose or as the odor of a, a rose fine so eliot feels that a poet has to create a unification of sensibility now what is this unification of sensibility so again eliot says that this this unification of sensibility means a direct sensuous apprehension of thought or a recreation of thought into feeling fine and uh, eliot feels that this this unification of sensibility uh, it was best achieved by by you know some metaphysical poets like like chapman marvel and and john dunn fine so when thought is transformed into feeling by the telescoping of images so the result is good poetry fine so when thought is transformed into feeling by the telescoping of images good poetry is created good poetry is produced but uh, when the poet is unable to present his thoughts as feelings then there'll be a split between thought and and feelings and according to t s eliot you know this split is bad this split is bad for poetry i hope you are getting my point so regarding this term you know unification of sensibility though he used it in in you know the metaphysical poets but uh, for your kind information you know he got this term i mean the term unification of sensibility from two french thinkers and uh, you know they are uh, remy de gaumont and uh, lucien levy so he got this term unification of sensibility from uh, from the two you know french thinkers uh, remy de gaumont 
and and lucian levy finally we can say that uh, t s eliot has been a major force in in the 20th century criticism and he is someone who who provided new heights to to english criticism so eliot is someone who feels that uh, literature is not a product of a historical moment or a philosophical foundation and those who feel that literature is a product of a historical moment or a philosophical foundation you know they should be called historians and philosophers fine so literature is not a product of of a historical moment or or any philosophical foundation then uh, you know eliot basically rejects vague emotionalism in in poetry fine to him you know a critic should be a critic should be preoccupied with with literature itself its its accurate usage of words rather than the phenomena flanking it fine then one thing is very particular and and here i would like to have your special attention do you feel that eliot was absolutely against the use of uh, uh, emotions in poetry you know while attacking on william wordsworth i mean while attacking on on uh, william wordsworth's uh, definition of poetry he said that poetry is not a turning loose of emotion rather it is an escape from emotion so the fact is that you know whether eliot is completely against the use of emotions in in poetry so let me clarify see uh, you know he is not he is not absolutely against the use use of emotions in poetry but he rejects the directness of of the overflow of emotions is that clear so he is not against against the use of emotions in poetry completely but you know he dislikes the overflow the overflow of emotions in in poetry and that's why you know he disliked sentimental poetry and and he respected tradition because sentimental poetry you know uh, it 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 shows the overflow of of emotions and he is against against the overflow of emotion fine then you know highest poetry according to ts eliot uh, it should synthesize thought and feeling argument and image and the rational and the non rational so it means according to ts eliot uh, highest poetry it must be an amalgamation of thought and feeling argument and image and and the rational and and the non rational fine and uh, in the end you can say that uh, you know eliot's critical intelligence it offered english criticism new new range of possibilities how you know it 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 offered criticism a new range of possibilities by his brilliant insights into into both the production and evaluation of literature so that is about t s eliot as a critic so i have talked about two critics today t e hume and n t s eliot and in the next clip i'll be coming with two or three more more critics thank you good day